Hey everybody, what's up? It's Ben Greenfield again, still out here in the hills of Kona, Hawaii hunting and still wanting to bring you an epic podcast. Uh, today's show is pretty significant. It's called How Silicon Valley, the Navy SEALs and Maverick Scientists are revolutionizing the way we live and work. Uh, it is based on one of the best books I read recently. You are going to absolutely dig it. But speaking of epic, I happen to get my hands on what is called a Marvel Hero Elite Iron Man Kettlebell. This thing lets you train like a genius billionaire playboy philanthropist with 40 pounds of iron. Iron Man. Uh, it's, a, it's literally, it's a, it's a kettlebell as the Iron Man helmet. You have to see this thing to believe it. Kettlebells are the best way to get fit fast to build muscle and burn fat at the same time. I've got tons of articles out there. If you go use googly moogly to Google Ben Greenfield Fitness uh, kettlebells, and you will find a lot out there. Well, this is the coolest kettlebell known to man. You can get it over on the website of today's sponsor, Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com. And if you go to Onnit dot com uh, slash Ben Greenfield, uh, that will automatically give you a fat discount on their supplements, their foods, and yes, even this kettlebell that you can swing around look very badass. Look like Iron Man. Exactly. That's your fantasy, right? Robert Downey Jr. and you swinging around. Check it out. Onnit.com slash Ben Greenfield. This podcast is also brought to you by something I learned uh, quite a bit about recently, lemons. Down here in Kona, I actually bought... Le lemons were one of the first things I bought when I landed just because I love to eat them as a digestif. I love to eat them as an alkalizing agent. They are chock full of things that you never would have thought. Like, of course, you know that they have vitamin C, but did you know? Did you know? They, uh, they constitute one of nature's seven top sources of potassium, which is a mineral that actually promotes clear thinking and helps to normalize blood pressure and works with sodium to regulate your body's water balance. It's also a very good source of citric acid. And citric acid, you can mix with just about anything to make stuff more absorbable. Well, lemon is just one of the many, many ingredients in some of the best tasting green juice powder on the face of the planet. It's called Organifi Green Juice. And along with lemon, they've got moringa, spirulina, chlorella, mint, beets, matcha green tea, ashwagandha, turmeric, coconut water, everything in the kitchen sink. And did I mention lemon? You can get this stuff over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash fit life. And when you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash fit life, use discount code Ben to get 20% off. And now you can go impress your friends with all that information. You just learned about lemons at your next cocktail party and impress your friends even more with what you're about to learn from my guests, Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel, authors of Stealing Fire. Let's do this and be sure to read the book too because we only scratched the surface of it. In this episode of the Ben Group from Fitness Show. New research is saying, wow, you can get a lot of creative enhancement and cognitive enhancement with a very short time frame of meditation. On top of that, we've now got a whole new level of neurotech that can record your brainwaves or the brainwaves of somebody in a meditative state. And we can use that information to steer novices into these states far quicker. This isn't just a supernatural experience. You might still have a belief system that that's one of the ways you explain it, but it's also showing up in our bodies and brains. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Mobility, balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement, get out there when you look at all the studies done. Studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey, folks, I have a guest on today's show who has been on the show two times already. Uh, he first appeared on this podcast in an episode called Decoding the Science of Ultimate Human Performance, where he talked about this book that he wrote called, among other, other things, The Rise of Superman. 
Decoding the Science of Ultimate Human Performance. Uh, and in that book and in the podcast, he told us how to biohack ourselves into a state of flow and to tap into flow to achieve amazing feats of physical and mental performance, even if you're not a super athlete. Uh, and then we had a second podcast where we talked about why the future of health is better than you think. And this other book that he wrote called Abundance, where he presented this kind of contrarian view that that exponentially growing technologies and other powerful powerful forces are conspiring to better the lives of everybody and that is going to change everything from water to food to energy to healthcare to education to freedom and he recently partnered up with the executive director of what's called the flow genome product and a leading expert on the neurophysiology of human performance uh and uh, that guy's name is jamie wheel the guy who's been on the podcast already a couple times, his name is Stephen Kotler. And together, they just finished writing a book, uh, a, a relatively dog-eared book that I'm holding in my hands because I folded over so many pages, called Stealing Fire, How Silicon Valley, the Navy SEALs, and Maverick Scientists are Revolutionizing the Way We Live and Work. Um, this book is not only a, a thrilling page turner, even though it's, it's not a, it's not a fiction. It's, it's, it's a, it's a nonfiction book that, that goes into a ton from, from, uh, Navy SEAL team six to the Googleplex to the Burning Man festival, to Richard Branson's Necker Island, to Red Bull's training center and Nike's innovation team and the United Nations headquarters and all of the stunning things that Jamie and Steven learned when finding out how these guys tick and how they actually achieve things like, you know, what, what meditation practitioners uh, take years to learn these folks are doing in weeks and months and why Google is hiring people who are attending Burning Man and how LSD and psilocybin do things like make religion more meaningful and help people solve the world's tech problems. So we're going to delve into all of this today with Stephen and Jamie, who are both here on the show with me right now. So guys, welcome to the podcast. Ben, thanks, thanks for having us. Ben. Awesome. Good to be back with you. Yeah, I'm actually I'm I'm quite ecstatic to have you on the show, and uh, I, I learn in your book what it actually means to be ecstatic, and uh, in particular what that has to do with uh, with the Navy SEALs, who you wouldn't necessarily think of as a bunch of ecstatic guys running around, but apparently uh, ecstasy uh, certainly has a little bit of a connection there with uh, with the SEALs. So I think that might be a perfect place to start here. What what is ecstasy and and why is it that you place such an importance on putting that so early in the book it's a great question it's a great place to start um oh and and by by the way for those of you listening in that is the voice of steven that you're you're hearing now the voice of steven coming to you live mm -hmm. um so i mean the funny thing about the term ecstasy which it comes from the greek meaning ex stasis to step beyond oneself and it refers to kind of a whole suite of non-ordinary states of consciousness where our normal sense of self tends to disappear and we gain access to kind of a richer, deeper information feed. So creativity goes up, pattern recognition goes up, um, the information we have access to goes up. And it the, the actual term we were came to us from uh, work we were doing with the Navy SEALs, you know, Jamie and, Jamie and myself as the co-founders of the Flow Genome Project have sort of been a running around the world kind of training people up in the use of one particular non-ordinary state of consciousness, flow, that's sort of got a 150-year track record of improving performance. And when we were spending time with the Navy SEALs, uh, one, of the, one of the people we were with, Rich Davis, who is uh, commander, lieutenant commander of SEAL Team 6, um, or DevGuru as they prefer, uh, he used the term. And what he was talking about is he used it as a substitute for what we would more commonly refer to as group flow, the shared collective version of a flow state, right? So instead of an individual performing at their peak, it's a group performing at their peak. And what we learned from him was that pretty much everything we think of as SEAL training, once you get beyond a certain, you know, incredible level of skills acquisition and physical fitness, everything we think of as SEAL training is, giant, is a giant screening process, training facility for training SEALs to drop into a state of ecstasis to drop into a state of group flow, state where the self can disappear and they can perform collectively in ways that were just not possible alone. So, so is ecstasis uh, basically a, like a flow state that goes beyond an individual and instead extends to the entire group as a whole? 
Yeah, I mean, in a simple sense, um, the reason we had, you know, we sort of reeled it all the way back to the to the ancient Greeks for that terminology was because in our in our work, as Stephen said, kind of traveling around and meeting with these high performing organizations, a consistent thing happened, which is people would sort of buttonhole us in the hallways or over drinks at dinner and say, hey, psst, by the way. Um, I'm using transcranial, you know, I'm shooting, you know, electricity through my brain, or I'm stacking off prescription pharmaceuticals, or we're a team of engineers in Silicon Valley, and we're microdosing on psilocybin, or I just went to this sexuality and tantra workshop, or a nine-day meditation, is that flow? <laughs> and so we found ourselves thinking, well, we've got two choices. Either we stretch the working definition of flow so far that basically the re, you know the academics and researchers that you know that started the field would not recognize it, um, or we had to kind of come up with a bigger category of which flow was a subset. So what Stephen was just describing with the Navy guys is was absolutely group flow, and that was how yes, it's not just an individual getting into that state of selfless you know high performance. It's when you do that and then link up with others, but it also included a whole range of activities ranging from meditation and mystical states to smart tech enabled states to sexually induced states to psychedelic states to flow states that we've been you know been working with for quite some time so it's really that whole bigger category of anything other than 21st century western normal okay got it so when it comes to achieving this state of ecstasis and the this group flow state the folks like the the navy seals are tapping into one of the very first things that you mention in the book, aside from ecstasis, is, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this properly, kaikeon, some some dark liquid at the heart of these <laughs> rituals that the Greeks used to have. What in the heck does that have to do with this state of ecstasis, this state of flow? So it's, it, it's a great question. Um, so one of the things that uh, kind of emerged out of our research into flow, we were kind of building what we called the flow genome matrix. These were all the kind of biological, physiological inputs that could create a flow state from like, you know, what are your brain waves doing? What, what, what's going on with your neural anatomy, the location spots in the brain? What neurochemicals in your body are in your body? What's your endocrine system doing? What's your heart doing? You know, we were looking at all these biomarkers for flow. And, you know, as it turns out, when we were done, we sort of ended up with an accidental Rosetta Stone for all these kind of these larger cate non-ordinary categories, one of which is psychedelics. So Kaikion is the potion that it was at the heart of the rites of Eleusis, one of the kind of oldest mystery cults in history. And the rites of Eleusis were a nine-day, very elaborate death and rebirth ritual that all of the kind of the elect of Greek society took part in and, and, and the experiences that they had during this ritual um, were very, very powerful. It ended up influencing Plato and Pythagoras and, and just exporting so much culture into the world came out of this very strange right. And they deployed a suite of state changing technologies from kind of drumming and dancing to fasting and aerobic activity. But the final one was Kaikion, which People are, you know, still argue about, but they think it was a derivative of LSD, basically a, a potion that was built around a rye ergot fungus that altered consciousness in a very kind of specific way. A rye so, ergot, you mean that, that this is like a fungus that came from a grain that they somehow used as a hallucinogen very similar to LSD to achieve this, this state of group flow? The, so what they they think it, LSA is the actual compound. It's a precursor to LSD. So okay. LSD actually derivatives came. I, I believe I believe I'm right here. Came out of studying ergot funguses. Interesting. Okay, got it. So so they actually would use this and and what what was it like a liquid that they drink? Yeah, they they would brew it down. I mean, there's very fragmentary records because disclosing any of the mysteries of Eleusis was punishable on pain of death. Oh, wow. But there are there are a couple of intriguing things. And, and, and Alcibiades, which, which was the the sort of trust funder, chicken boy, Socrates' chicken boy, um, who stole it uh, and then gets run through the Athenian courts against it. We got we got a couple of snippets from his court records. And one of them was, you know, it had to be diluted 10 parts to one with regular wine. So we know that. We know it was concentrated and packed a hell of a punch. Um, and we also know 
that the experiences in Plutarch, the, the Greek historian talked about, he says, at first we have fears and terrors and mortal sweats, and then we break through into where this place where celestial visions are held. So you kind of, you had some subjective accounting that yeah, the stuff worked. And then you had the idea that, you know, one of the initiates decided to steal some from the temple and throw a raging house party. So it had to be presumably pretty enjoyable. So beyond that, everything else is circumstantial, but there have been a number of kind of uh, ethnopharmacologists and folks who have tried to kind of decode what they think is in it. And those are kind of some of our, our, our leading candidates. Now, when ben, I think I mean, the real important point is, you know, Stealing Fire is a book about a huge, you know, four trillion dollar underground revolution that's ha happening right now and people hacking states of consciousness to massively increase performance. But the point we're making is, you know, there's a reason it's happening now, but there's also nothing new under the sun, right? People have been using non-ordinary states of consciousness to kind of increase performance and seed culture since, you know, since the time of the Greeks, you know, recorded and probably dates back far earlier than that. So we are looking at the most current instance of what is essentially a perennial pattern. Back from from back when one of these very first guys who was who was uh, L, L, how do you pronounce his name? There's this a hundred. It uh, depends L, on who, the, who your the, Greek the, teacher the, was. The, the Greek general, the, the politician it's, who who basically yeah. stole this. He he stole the Kaikion and and that's what you're referring to when you say stealing fire. It's that same kind of concept of him actually stealing the recipe for this to to spark a revolution from to spark change from to spark flow. That's that's kind of like what we're seeing now in our culture as far as people almost like shortcutting their way into these same kind of states. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and just to kind of show the strangeness of this underground movement, you know, when we were with DevGru and getting getting a tour of their mind gym, which was this new multi-million dollar facility specifically designed to help more of their operators learn to flip that switch. Wait, where, gain, where, where, where was this mind gym? This is actually in DevGru's headquarters uh, near Virginia Beach. What's DevGru? DevGru is, DevGru is SEAL Team 6. Okay, got it. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we were getting to go around the tour and there was lots of things that you're familiar with as well. There was kind of, you know, EEG feedback and cardiac stuff and products from Nike and products from other kind of leading fitness brands and stuff you'd see at things like the NFL Combine. And then we went around this final corner in the space and there were these four pods sitting there and they were they were sensory deprivation tanks or float tanks. Um, and, you know, we were like, what, what on earth are those doing here? Because float tanks up until kind of the last five years where folks like Joe Rogan and others have been kind of, you know, singing their praises, they were really just the sort of far out edgy domains of kind of hippies and hippies and heads um, because they've been designed in the 1960s for, a, you know, basically if you put yourself in pitch black floating water with no sense of boundaries and that kind of sense, you know, sensations of your body, it's a truly, it's an, it's an experience of ecstasis. You are outside your normal self. Well, the, these guys had been taking it and adding in a lot of smart tech and sensors. So they had cardiac rhythms, they had EEG feedback, they had all these additional loops in it, and they were using it to put operators in hyper-attuned body-mind states of consciousness, and then they were using it to learn foreign languages. So obviously if they deployed from, you know, whether it's hmm. Pashtun or, or, or Hindi or an African dialect or where they were in the Middle East, they would need to quickly learn um, you know, to be a, enough to be conversant in the theater of deployment. And it used to take them six months of intensive training to make that switch. And now using these float tanks, which had been the realm of hippies and heads, now they're using it to train up super soldiers. And it take, took them a quarter of the time to learn foreign languages. So that was one of the moments where we really figured out, hey, there's something, there's something strange going on as far as how all of this cross-pollination is happening and who's actually in on this same game. So would this be the same type of technique that, because you, know, you talk about how meditation practitioners now are achieving in months what used to take years. Are they also using float tanks or are they using some other kind of uh, piece of equipment or, or uh, psychedelic? No, so, so it's, a, it's a great question. Um, the first thing you need to know is that, you know, 100 years ago, William James pointed out that a whole bunch of states from you know, awe to flow states, to meditation, to contemplative states, to so-called mystical states, speaking in tongues, out-of-body experiences, what have you, um, to kind of sexually and 
uh, sexually mediated, you know, ecstatic states, all these things seem to be the same thing. And a hundred years, you know, go by and nobody really noticed this or paid any attention to it. But a hundred years later, we've started to kind of decode the neurobiology, all of these states, all, everything that fits under that broad category of ecstasis that Jamie talked about earlier, altered the brain in roughly the same way. They're not identical. So no, you know, being on Kaikion is not being in a meditative state, but most of the knobs and levers underneath the experience are the same, right? So we're seeing that they're doing sort of the same thing in the brain. And this is allowing us to A, realize that a whole bunch of, you know, disparate groups of people would never talk to one another, never think they were doing the same thing, right? From the military industrial complex, you know, what Jamie's talking about to kind of hippies and heads and ravers and seekers. They're all the Dave Asprey biohacking crowd. They're all roughly doing the same thing. They're trying to change the channel on normal consciousness. Now, when you say that they're changing the brain, what, what, what do you mean? Like what's happening in the brain when someone is getting into a float tank or, you know, as, as you allude to in the book, like these meditators are hooking themselves up to, to neurofeedback devices. Like what's that actually doing? So let me, let me specifically kind of speak to your question. So in, in the early 90s, a guy named Richard Davidson, University of Wisconsin, did uh, very detailed studies on meditation. And he, on, on, on Tibetan monks who had been meditating th- on average 34,000 hours of meditation, right, which is essentially 30 plus years. And he found some amazing things. One of the things he discovered is that brainwaves of longtime meditator, meditators are more likely to be in the gamma range. Now, gamma is a really unusual brainwave that usually normally only shows up during binding. That is when a bunch of kind of new ideas come together and, 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 and give you like that aha insight, that, that eureka moment. So this was a first clue that, hey, wait a minute, meditation can actually impact creativity, but 34,000 hours, who the hell has, you know, 30 hours, let alone 30 years? Recently at the University of North Carolina, they realized that four days of meditation can actually produce the same effect. So new research is saying, wow, you can get a lot of creative enhancement and cognitive enhancement with a very short time frame of meditation. On top of that, we've now got a whole new level of neurotech that can record your brainwaves or the brainwaves of somebody in a meditative state. And we can use that information to steer novices into these states far quicker. So what used to take decades can now take weeks or months. As you know, as Jamie pointed out, we went with the Navy SEALs learning a foreign language that accelerated learning went from a six month process down to a six week process. Would would this be uh, neurofeedback? And the reason I ask this is, is I visited the Peak Brain Institute down in L.A., and they did a brain mapping on me where they identified areas of fast beta brain waves or areas of alpha theta ratios that were that were unfavorable. And they actually gave me a bunch of protocols. You know, I, I went back with this laptop and a whole bunch of equipment. And now I, you know, every other day for 30 minutes, I fly spaceships with my brain to basically fix my brain map. And I, I actually just went, I flew back down to LA a couple of weeks ago and remapped my brain and all these areas of fast beta brainwave production, and this was this was in four months, are totally gone. Is this the same type of thing that that you guys are talking about when you talk about like hacking meditation? Exactly what we're talking about. And you can also do yeah. that type of thing with float tanks. You can do it. I mean, the bottom line is these days, you know, and we make that case in the middle section of the book, which is like due to these sort of what we call the four forces, like an expansion of the field of psychology, neurobiology, technology, and pharmacology, because all those fields have been advancing so fast and now they're now they're coinciding at this intersection of like we can basically tune our consciousness to suit our goals and our preferences and you can use biohacking stuff you can use laptops and feedback custom design pharmacology you can you can use in you know normal kind of learning experiences you can use extreme athletic experiences pretty much you know huge dance parties it doesn't really matter mm. the ways in are now abundant and and easily accessible to everyone so now it's a combination of how do we stack these how do we combine these in ways that are fun interesting and effective although a huge dance party gets a little bit more exhausting than laying in a float tank <laughs> admittedly <laughs> you you talk yeah. about in the book how like at the center of all this complexity is your prefrontal cortex which is like what you describe as the most sophisticated piece of neuronal hardware 
and that we somehow, when we are achieving these states of flow, we shut that down. What, what's that mean exactly, that, that, you, that you shut down an area of the brain? Well, so the first thing you need to know is that the brain is, um, it has a fixed energy budget. It only has so many calories in, in the day, right? So the first order of business for the brain is to conserve energy whenever possible. So what happens in a lot of these the non-ordinary states, say the meditative states, for example, or, or an action sport induced flow state is our need for attention, focused attention in the present moment goes up and up and up, right? That's the whole point of meditation. You're following your breath. So you can follow it right into the present moment. Flow states, you're paying you know, critical attention to everything that's going on around you. Um, and what happens is the brain performs an efficiency exchange. It starts takes more energy, gives you more energy for focus, and it starts to shut down non-critical areas. Now, a lot of those non-critical areas are located in the prefrontal cortex, which, as you mentioned, is the our most sophisticated piece of neuronal hardware. It's the most recent evolutionary adaptation, and it's where we do complex decision-making, long-term planning, your sense of morality, your sense of will. As we move into these states, that portion of the brain starts to deactivate. It shuts down. And as a result, for example, one of the things that happens in all these states is our sense of self disappears, right? That your, your, your inner critic goes silent. And that happens because your sense of self is generated all over by structures all over the prefrontal cortex, it's sort of a network effect. And as parts of those nodes start to deactivate, we lose the ability to generate our sense of self, which is one of the things we talk about ecstasis, changing the channel on normal waking consciousness, getting outside yourself. That's why it happens. And that's one of the things that all of these states have in common. So we're basically like silencing our inner critic when we engage in any of these methods, like the float tank, like neurofeedback, like these dance parties that somehow allow us to go into this selfless mode where we're losing our ability to be able to to criticize or, or overanalyze what it is that we're actually doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and not only is that a, a relief for kind of the obvious reasons, I mean, many of us actively seek, including just like CrossFitters. I mean, people who get hooked on a really intense workout and, you know, people who sort of say, I need to get my workout in. Anytime you have folks, even in the exercise space, that sort of language their experience in that way, as often as not, is to get to, um, in, in that specific instance, exercise induced selflessness. Um, but, but dancing, meditating, any and all of these things are giving us those moments just where that voice inside our head goes quiet. Now, are, there, for, uh, are, are there actual, sorry to interrupt, are there, are there actual chemicals associated with this? Like, are we, um, are, are we getting a release of any specific chemicals associated with that state of a shutdown of the prefrontal cortex? Yeah. And, and, and that's a great question. Our, I mean, our assumption is yes, um, we have our kind of list of leading candidates. And then we just got to put a big caution here as far as like popularizing specific academic research, because most of the researchers are in neurochemistry, meaning what, you know, what, what is it dopamine? Is it endorphins? Is it, you know, is it oxytocin? Is it serotonin? They're either in that space or they're in neuroanatomy, what parts of the brain are lighting up and on and off and when, or they're in neuroelectricity. There aren't a ton of researchers that are across all of them and able to pinpoint in time which of those intersections is happening when. That's kind of weird. I mean, but, it seems kind of like low-hanging fruit that you could somehow have some kind of facility or research group devoted to the neuroanatomy, the neurochemistry, and the, what was the last one, the neuroelectricity, you said? Yeah. Yeah, so you could be studying the chemicals, the, the brain waves, and then also the actual areas like, like the cortex, et cetera. It seems like somebody would be able to, to study all three of those. That is starting to happen. It was a... It, it's it's not a desire issue. The, desire, the will is there. It's a technology issue, mm. right? A lot of, for example, a lot of the neurochemicals, right, that we're, we're interested in, dopamine, for example, these are produced by very old, very ancient, very well-buried structures in the brain that are hard to get at with imaging until recently. So there's been no easy way to combine it. Also, the resolution of the different technologies, EEG, which measures brain waves, can measure very thin slices in time. Until very, very recently, fMRI took static pictures. Now, you can't put somebody on an EEG headset into an fMRI because 
you're, you know, there's metal in there. So they, the technologies don't combine easily. So these are technological hurdles. But one of the points we, we, are, we make in the book is you know, the four forces of ecstasis that Jamie alluded to, right? You know, technology, pharmacology, neurobiology, psychology, all of these seem to have become information technologies, meaning they've, you know, been, they can be translated into ones and zeros. And Ray Kurzweil at Google taught us that once the technology becomes an information technology, it jumps on the back of Moore's law and starts accelerating exponentially. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a combination of these technologies coming together for the first time, giving us a clearer and clearer picture of what's going on. So yes, there are huge gaping holes we can drive a bus through, but we are making faster and faster and faster progress than, than ever before. And it's really, you know, it's an amazing thing to see. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Ben, just, just to go back, I mean, that was a lengthy disclaimer, <laughs> but to then say, okay, so now if we were going to take a swing at this, what would we say? And so we would, we would suggest that um, alongside those parts of your prefrontal cortex coming down, those, those wonderful feelings of selflessness, inner quiet, you are going to, generally speaking, see a shift from stress neurochemicals like norepinephrine and cortisol into ones of well-being, pain relief, and lateral connection. So you will you would likely see an increase in dopamine and endorphins, potentially anandamide, and then additionally serotonin and oxytocin. And for instance, Molly Crockett, who's a neuropsychologist at Oxford, spends a ton of time researching the serotonin system. She's linked that to a lot of the activities, meditation, dance festivals, Burning Man. She's actually done studies of the Burning Man Festival specifically and sh and, and is advancing the case that it, it, it interacts with the serotonin network. She also just published something at the World Economic Forum in Davos just uh, 10 days ago, which was basically saying that some of the angry populism that's sweeping both North America and Europe right now is, is potentially due to chronic low stress, particularly in displaced populations, folks whose, whose worlds are shrinking or are increasingly hot, <laughs> dropping serotonin, and that actually the, the bonding of these rallies and these movements boosting dopamine. And what you'll see in people with chronically low serotonin is increased aggression, increased hostility, and increased tribalism. So it can kind of play for good and ill across our spectrums. But I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, we start with our, with our neurobiology. You actually go, go into that a little bit in the book about how, as you move deeper into that state of ecstasis, how that anandamide chemical that you talked about gets released. And that actually plays a role in lateral thinking, like your ability to make these far flung connections between all these, these disparate ideas. And that actually helps to shift your brainwaves into theta, which you'd normally only produce during like REM sleep when you're, you know, engaged in, in lucid dreaming and things like that. And so if you somehow get yourself into these states of flow, you're able to, to solve problems a little bit better. Now you mentioned burning man and how that is one of the ways that, that we get ourselves into that state. Is that why you tell the story in the book, Google is actually interested in hiring people who do things like frequent burning man? To be clear, that was a tale from way back when, 2001, I think, where they were in, they were, you know, Larry and Sergey as young bucks coming out of Stanford grad school and really just kind of had the tiger by the tail of this Google algorithm. Um, and that was when their investors um, insisted that they get some adult supervision. And they basically spent a year interviewing all the kind of usual suspects of CEOs. And they basically said, yeah, we found the guy. His name's Steve Jobs. Um, and he's the only one we'll, we'll take on. And then so they were kind of, and Steve obviously wasn't going to leave Apple anytime soon. So they were really kind of running out of time. And then that Eric Schmidt, who was on their medium-ish list, but not their shortest of lists, had been to Burning Man. They're like, oh, well, we go. We've been going since the very beginning. In fact, the very first Google Doodle they ever they ever drew was of the Burning Man, the Burning Man sort of stick figure icon over the the O and the Google. So they were longtime enthusiastic burners. They had lots of their early engineers that would go out into the desert and build these wild ass crazy engineering projects and bits of sort of oversized performance art. So they figured, okay, we need someone who can not just manage and scale a company but who can preserve our kind of funky, eclectic genius and who can also really understand what a group flow state is like for a bunch of high performing engineers. So that's kind of how they used Burning Man as an extended filter for could Eric, you know, bring the adult supervision we need without wringing out the genius that we're, we're you know, really interested in protecting. So Burning Man, 
Have you, have you guys been to that? Yep. Yes. Okay. What actually, because, because a lot of people who are listening are relatively familiar with Burning Man. Many of them I know have been there. Uh, but for, for those people who haven't, what, what can people expect if, if they decide, oh, I want to, I want to get involved with being in this state of group ecstasis and group flow and experience some of these things that you're talking about? And, and perhaps we'll get into the, the psychedelics and all that a little bit later in this show. But for people interested in going to Burning Man, I mean, I know you have a whole chapter devoted to this in the book, but why do you think they should go? Like, what would be the argument for going to something like Burning Man? Because a lot of people still think it's just like some crazy party on the desert. Uh-huh. But let's be clear, it is some crazy party on the desert. <laughs> But it's, right. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it, Burning Man is a essentially a week long festival that takes place in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. So one of the flattest places on earth is this giant canvas, and it's a giant, you know, art project at a scale you've never seen. So what gets created out in the desert and then burned to the ground, you know, a couple week a, a week later and disappears forever, leave no trace as their model, and they really stick to it you know, is the most co- like colossal display of state changing technology anywhere on the universe from, you know, giant fires spewing dinosaurs to, you know, enormous Tesla coils shooting lightning all over the place to world famous DJs and phenomenal light shows and, you know, all centered around the burning of a hundred foot sculpture, the Burning Man. Um, and it's a, by the way, it's a modern day rites of Eleusis. It's a death and rebirth ritual that takes place in the desert. And, um, you know, our point is goes about Burning Man, you know, goes back to kind of where this thread started with you is it's not only, you know, 10 years ago or 20 or 15 years ago, Google was using it as a as a screening mechanism for adult su- supervision. But it's gone from kind of this wild party in the desert that it attracted counterculture to now it's attracting, you know, members of the World Economic Forum, Morgan Stanley, Dab. I mean, the list goes on and on. People of power, money, and influence, and the experiences of Burning Man are bleeding out into the real world in really big ways. And, and one of the examples we give is Tony Shea and Zappos, where he's rearranging his entire corporate hierarchy and really take place in a big bet that is not going perfectly um, to kind of bring that, that the group flow that they find so easily at Burning Man more into his company. And then he's redesigning downtown Vegas. His downtown Vegas project is a $350 million urban renewal project that's based on importing these same ideas into downtown Vegas. So we're seeing stuff that started out in the desert, right? These transformations in the desert bleed into and impact culture, you know, right onto Main Street. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show uh, to tell you about a special way to turbocharge your brain. Sure, you could use all of the brain-bending compounds that I've been talking about with today's podcast guests. You can also use stuff like alpha-GPC, which is a choline compound found in your brain and also found in things like meat and fish. It increases power output when you're exercising. It improves your memory. It enhances your mental focus. And this stuff is blended along with taurine, along with L-theanine, which helps to keep some of the uh, some of the jittery edge off of coffee. I almost stuttered there. Maybe I've had too much coffee today. Or maybe I've just been hunting all day and I'm recording today's commercials uh, at the end of a day of hunting. It has DMA in it as well. Uh, it's called Camara Coffee. I actually need to go find some. I feel like I need a cup of coffee right now. And this is the best tasting coffee and also the only coffee I've ever found that has a bunch of nootropics, which are basically herbal natural versions of smart drugs, all natural amino acids you typically find in protein rich foods, but now they're all in your coffee. You get them all in this stuff. Camara Coffee, K I M E R A K O F F E E. And when you go to camaracoffee.com, if you use discount code, drum roll please, Ben, that gets you 10% off over at camaracoffee.com. Finally, this podcast is brought to you by Mushroom and Barley Miso Ramen. Well, miso is one of those fermented forms of tofu that I actually approve of versus the man boob generating alternative forms of tofu. And the northernmost Japanese island of Hokkaido is famous for popularizing the use of miso, also known as fermented soybean paste, in ramen broth. This company, what they do is they ship all these recipes to your house and you make them. And the one that I'm getting this week is mushroom and barley miso ramen with smoked dulce and spicy red cabbage. 
and it even gets topped traditionally, as they do in Japan, so I hear, with a soft-boiled egg. So this and so many other recipes are brought to you by this website called Blue Apron. Check them out at blueapron.com. They ship fresh, high-quality ingredients to your door and let you make these gourmet meals in under 40 minutes for less than 10 bucks a person. You can knock the socks off your friends. You can teach your kids to cook. You can pat yourself on the back for making some fringe Japanese recipe you've never heard of before. Uh, and it tastes really good. You get your first three meals for totally free with free shipping when you go to blueapron.com slash Ben. That's blueapron.com slash Ben. You get your meals free with free shipping. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Now back to today's show. So what you're saying is that when... Folks are attending Burning Man. They're actually coming out of Burning Man and creating these amazing projects elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, and again, we, we just alluded to uh, Molly Crockett, uh, the researcher at Oxford, who's been working with the BlackRock Census, which is a census of all the attendees of Burning Man, and finding you know massive, you know, three quarter transformation, three quarter of the people experiencing transformation while there. So they're experiencing a you know an extended or several extended non ordinary states of consciousness. A lot of the research coming out of Stanford and elsewhere, um, showing that, you know, getting into these non-ordinary states, tinkering with your serotonin, dopamine, you know, endorphin systems tends to produce increased creativity, problem solving and, and lateral connections. And then, of course, you know, what's happening at Burning Man is, you know, what we call, you know, we should term it the sandbox of the future. You have people, everyone from Elon Musk, who first debuted his, his initial Tesla Roadster there in 2008 to you know, to the folks uh, at I the camp called Ideate that in 2012 were pioneering 3D models and drone direct delivery, and they were using it to be able as a demonstration project of delivering medications and things in NGO and disaster areas, which is obviously now showing up as like Amazon shipping everywhere else. So people are using the incredibly harsh environments of that space, but also the highly creative environment to pilot test projects. Larry Page at Recode a few years ago said, you know, I, I think I think the world needs a place like Burning Man where we can test out these ideas, you know, with, with, with low consequence, and then let's roll them out in the world. So you really see it as an incubator for everything from clothing and fashion to media to immersive tech to disaster relief and urban planning. Yeah. So all sorts of things coming out of that space. It's really interesting. I was actually thinking about going this year. One of my buddies is, is uh, possibly putting together a, a trip for a few people. So I might wind up there. And and your book certainly got me thinking more seriously about it. Um, I, I have, of course, you know, delved into some of the things that you talk about in the book, though, in terms of cognitive performance enhancement and expanding lateral thinking um, in the realm of psychedelics. You know, for example... Uh, microdosing with LSD. You talk about that in the book. It, it's something in, in the past few months, um, along with microdosing with uh, with psilocybin, I've been messing around with a little bit. And um, you, you kind of go into some interesting studies that have been done, uh, particularly on LSD and problem-solving capabilities. Can you go into what, what you describe in the book when it comes to the use of LSD? Sure. This is James Fadiman's research, and he's sort of been everywhere recently, including, you know, in Tim Ferriss's new book, Tools for Titans. Um, but back in the 60s, before the research was uh, outlawed, before LSD became a Schedule One substance, he was doing work in, in Silicon Valley and with microdosing, so taking sub-perceptual, very small doses of psychedelics. Um, research, he was looking at mescaline and LSD. Um, for problem solving. And he literally brought together teams of engineers from Silicon Valley from all over who had been struggling for, I think it was a minimum of three months to solve a highly technical problem. And so he, you know, over the course of, of a couple of months, conducted research on a lot of people and got really astounding results. He, on average, they reported a 200% spike in creativity. But what where it gets really interesting is you look at like the things that came out of it, it was a new design for a NOR gate, a new design for a solar cell, a new theory of how an electron function goes on and on. Really highly technical, so-called so wicked problems, right, that defy kind of easy either or solutions. And he has, you know, since searched up because a lot of people have started microdosing, especially in Silicon Valley. And... So there's he's running an informal meaning, you know, the, it is still illegal to do this. So he's, you know, basically collecting data through his website. But I think four or five hundred people have now taken part in his survey 
on microdosing and they were reporting enhanced pattern recognition, increased creativity, increased cognitive function. So, you know, it's really starting to look like microdosing, um, you know, can, can be a real performance enhancing tool. Interesting. So when you're talking about microdosing, uh, uh, how, how much less LSD would you be taking compared to say like a, a trip dose or what someone might have taken, say like, you know, in, in the in the 70s? which is, I know, painting yeah. a broad brush. I don't, I'm just saying the 70s because that's the era we associate quite a bit with, with LSD use that in the, in the 60s to a certain extent. Sure. I mean, so, so I think, you know, if you sort of talk about heroic doses versus museum or IMAX doses versus <laughs> micro doses, right? Typically the micro dose um, would be about one tenth of what would be a you know, functional, a functional kind of quote unquote trip. So the research is at Johns Hopkins, who have been doing, you know, uh, psilocybin therapy with everyone from people trying to stop smoking to people facing end of life with terminal cancer diagnosis has been about three grams. So you would presume, you know, you would walk that back to about a third of a gram for an experience. And the key here is that, you know, lest anybody still has any kind of sort of hangups or judgments about quote unquote doing drugs, um, the idea here is that, you know, A, these are sub-perceptual. So for the sort of crypto Puritans out there, there's no fun to be had. You're not actually experiencing anything externally changing or shifting. But what is happening, and this is really kind of the bigger point of the book, Ben, which is that this is not this is not a book about the psychedelic renaissance. You know, Michael Pollan, Tim Ferriss, there's tons of other people that have been covering that. It's showing up, you know, it's been it's been pretty much a drumbeat for the last few years, citing all these studies. And nor is this a book just about flow or a book just about meditation or smart tech. The idea is, look, what that microdosing does, the benefits that Stephen was just talking about with the problem solving with the engineers uh, in Palo Alto, that's interacting with the serotonin system, mm. right? That's what psilocybin and LSD do. That research got shut down four decades ago when we got Prozac instead. Right. Because it interacts with the serotonin system. So all we're doing is we're really reviving some additional tools, and then we're developing other ones like smart tech and VR and AR that are interacting with our nervous systems and our neurobiology in ways that are giving us better results with fewer side effects than the current batch of tools we've been forced to use. Right. And, and it's kind of interesting because you, you have a quote from Tim Ferriss that says the billionaires that he knows almost without exception use hallucinogens like that on a regular basis. Uh, and of course, you just alluded to another one, uh, psilocybin. And you guys have a really interesting anecdote on psilocybin and its relationship with religion and especially religious experiences. Can you go into what you discovered in this book and what you describe about the link between psilocybin and, and faith-based practices? This is some of the kind of oldest uh, research that was done on, on psychedelics. It's a, it, it dates back to an early study known as the Good Friday Experiment. And what they were trying to settle is something called the skin bag bias. The skin bag bias is this kind of long-standing belief in spiritual traditions that any mystical experience that is produced through hard work, meditation, prayer, living in a monastery, putting in your time, right, is valid and true. And any mystical experience that is produced by an external stimulus, be it technology, brain, you know, neurostimulation or pharmacology, right, a psychedelic like LSD or psilocybin um, is invalid. So what they did is they got together a bunch of seminary students at Harvard who they thought would be actually more susceptible to a mystical experience. And they went and everybody attended the Good Friday service. Half the group was given a placebo, niacin, which sort of mimics some of the kind of pharmacological impacts of psilocybin, but obviously doesn't affect cognition. The other half of the group was given psilocybin. And afterwards, they rated their experience in terms of a variety of different kind of mystical categories. And when it was done, it was pretty clear that psychedelics could produce a valid and true mystical experience. That said, what's so kind of unusual about this particular study is, A, the skin bag bias is, is very, it's so persistent that they've rerun the study on multiple occasions to revalidate this. And it was most recently done by Roland Griffith at Johns Hopkins. And before Roland started doing all his work with cure, Smokey Jamie referenced a lot of it at end of life therapy. The first thing he wanted to do was prove that yet again, turns out that psilocybin 
produces kind of valid so-called mystical experiences. And, you know, the, the greatest detail about the original Good Friday experiments that sort of proves this point is none of the people in the placebo group who got niacin ended up becoming priests. And I think everybody but one in the group that got psilocybin ended up finishing the seminary and becoming priests. And many of them throughout the course of their lives called it one of the most powerful experiences you know, of their lives. Yeah. And I mean, and look, I'm, I'm a Christian and, uh, you know, I, I engage in prayer and devotions and speak to God and some of my most intense religious experiences and connections uh, from a spiritual standpoint have been on psilocybin. It, it really is quite interesting how you almost, ha- you know, I, I'm not saying you got to like take shrooms if you want to have a more meaningful experience at church or whatever, but at the same time, um, it is, uh, something that's kind of interesting to do. And, and yes, I have actually microdosed with psilocybin before church and found myself far more caught up in the flow, in the energy, in the spirituality, and in the religious experience, uh, with the use of something like mushrooms combined with religion. So it's, it's really quite fascinating, uh, as is speaking of religion, the God helmet that you talk about in the book, can you get into the God helmet and what that is? Sure. Back in the 50s, neuroscientists discovered that if you stimulate the right temporal lobe, you produce, you can produce all kinds of very strange so-called mystical experiences. So this will range from sense to presence, the feeling of a god or a ghost in the room with you, to hearing voices, to seeing visions, to having out-of-body experiences. The list sort of goes on and on. Um, and so in the 90s, a Canadian neuroscientist named Michael Persinger pioneered, he, he built a helmet, he took a motorcycle helmet, he gussied it out with kind of transcranial magnetic stimulation, and he's directing weak neck magnetic pulses to this portion of the brain. A couple thousand people have now worn the device, and 80% of them have had some kind of so-called mystical experience. Now, there are a lot of people some very, very famous people, including Richard Dawkins, who have worn the device and said, this is bullshit, nothing happens. So there's a flip side to this. But what the God Helmet sort of gives us a peek into is that neurobiology is kind of developing and accelerating so fast that experiences that were once reserved for kind of mystics or madmen, a very small portion of the population, can now be tasted by more and more people. Yeah, and that that was I, I know those wires and the nine volt battery. That's very similar to the thread on Reddit that shows you how to produce your own transdirect current stimulation device that you can wear on your head. And I actually own one. It's behind me here in my office. One called a a halo headset. It's not the god helmet, and it was designed more for stimulation of the motor cortex, right? For enhancing mm-hmm. my I can use it before I go play guitar or ukulele to enhance my ability to be able to learn music at a faster pace. I can use it before tennis to uh to acquire skill acquisition, you know, a little bit easier. You can even even use it before workout to reduce your rating of perceived exertion. But it's kind of based around the similar concept that you can you can stimulate certain cortices in the brain to produce certain responses you know and in this case the god helmet you talk about how it produces you know visions of god and sense presences and and other kind of like altered states related to religious experiences and so I, I could just imagine a whole bunch of people wearing special hats to church and uh, and, and stimulating the, their their cortices or their or their temporal lobes accordingly. Um, yeah, there, there's actually a whole science behind. You get into neurotheology in the in the book, and uh, and how people are actually studying what happens during these religious experiences. Can you get into what they're actually finding is occurring during these intense spiritual experiences that people are are, are getting into? Sure. I mean, I mean, you know, the the, some, the simplest is to realize, you know, just what you were describing, which is, you know, people might start wearing funny hats to church, right, and presumably getting something more out of it in a not dissimilar way to that good, right, where you had people on niacin experiencing not much and people on psilocybin experience a whole lot more. And so, well, while pharmacology, you know, what substances I might take to deliberately shift my consciousness might have been one of the earliest and most obvious ways to do it, you know, with the description of the God helmet that you're describing, you know, we're already moving from pharmacology to technology. And now we're getting into increasingly virtual with virtual reality and augmented reality and not just you know, goggles I put over my eyes, but, you know, entire systems or headsets I wear that, 
measure my bodily responses like your halo headset start actually juicing and shifting you know my my state of being um on purpose so we really are seeing kind of a migration of how to get to these spots and one of one of the things that's been accelerating that is this relatively young field of neurotheology which is what's the actual you know biology going on what's happening in our brains as, as we experience a range of what used to be called mystical experiences and that's everything from experiences of oneness all the way to more you know, abstruse and, and 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 sort of rarer ones like speaking in tongues or having experiencing a doppelganger effect and what what's really happening is we're saying first of all hey this isn't just a supernatural experience you might still have a belief system that that's one one of the ways you explain it but it's also showing up in our bodies and brains. And one of the things that's doing, in fact, David Brooks wrote about this in the New York Times. He said, look, this is revolutionizing basically religion and our participation in it. Because now instead of having, you know, all these prescriptions, you know, that come with religion saying you've got a few, this is who, what you wear, this is what you're allowed to eat or not eat, this is how you marry, this is how often how you pray, all these things, and then you'll get to glimpse God. We're realizing, oh, it's actually these three ingredients, right, in all of those, in all of that practice, that's really making the difference. And so now um, pe- we've kind of cut out the middleman. So in a lot of respects, the kind of the priest class, um, whether or not it's truly people in robes or not, but the, the priest class, as far as the mediators of the sacred, are getting disrupted. And you're having more and more people with the access of, oh, here's the neurobiological biological mechanism. Here's the cookbook for ecstasis. Now I can go and conduct those experiences myself. So they're simultaneously kind of demystifying the mystical and providing kind of open source access to many more people as a result of this field. The cookbook being different types of meditation and chanting and singing and flow, and then also some of these technologies that we've talked about and also some of these chemicals that we've talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And so so if nothing else, if, there, if there's kind of a, a bumper sticker maxim for this day and age is don't die wondering. Yeah. You know, if you're out there saying, is there more to life and is there a, is there a greater connection for me in this world or universe? And what are we like? Go conduct those experiments. They're a dime a dozen. And so, you know, that, that and then come back and figure out what you want to do to connect the dots between your waking life and, and that thing that you've just glimpsed. But definitely there's no reason to be sitting on our hand wondering or, or taking it from somebody else's secondhand reports. But when it comes to playing with our bodies like this, you, you get into in the book about how some things can actually like affect our, you know, how, how these these altered altered states or in some cases chemicals can affect our traits often in, in permanent ways or in ways that we might not want, like like a Botox, for example, um, you know, freezing the face with a neurotoxin. Why is it that that you guys don't appear to be very big fans of Botox? <laughs> I, well, I, that's a funny question. I don't think I think we're probably <laughs> neutral ultimately on Botox. But what we're talking about that 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 this what we talk about Botox is the opening to kind of our description of changes in neurobiology. So what? But one of the things that emerged out of Botox research, right, is when you freeze somebody's face, you're also cutting off their access to emotions, for example. Or if you freeze somebody's faces, if you make the frown lines disappear, they're reporting like long term happiness. But they're also reporting decreases in empathy. And what this kind of has led people to is, you know, this burgeoning growing body of research known as embodied cognition which simply says, you know, on a simple level with the facial muscles, says, hey, wait a minute, our facial muscles are hardwired into our emotions and you can't have one without the other. So if you are freezing the face, you're limiting kind of the emotions you can experience in the world. Embodied cognition is a larger field that says, hey, wait a minute, we're not just heads on sticks. The brain is a distributed whole body network. We have as many neurons in our heart and our stomach as we do in our brain. 90% of the body's serotonin is produced in our stomach. There are whole body integrated networks. So one of the things this, you know, and there's very easy ways to tinker with it. We talk about Amy Cuddy's research at Harvard, you know, and she discovered that simply how you stand, how you pose can impact hormonal levels in the body. And this goes all the way out to kind of like deeply embodied cognitive practices like yoga and tai chi and qigong that have been shown to kind of not just, you know, to use embodied cognition, use this whole body system to shift consciousness and unlock some of these states. So it's not that, you know, we're not fans of Botox. It's that the Botox 
research has led us in an incredibly interesting direction. Yeah, it, it is really, yeah. really interesting. How uh, you go even into the chapter on neurobiology about how, like, if someone gives you a cup of icy cold water to hold and then introduces you to a stranger, and they did this research at Yale, you treat them coldly, like you treat them with suspicion and with more distance than if you're holding a cup of hot coffee, in which case you trust them more easily. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost comical and how literal. The connections really are. I mean, the stuff that, you know, your old grandpa or grandma would have always said, you know, chin up, shoulders back, you know, mm -hmm. head straight, all those kind of things really make a difference. And literally the, the hot and the cold as well. So the idea is, you know, we probably are the most disembodied generation of humans ever on the planet. You know, we all walk around hunched looking over at screens. We, we sit for hours and hours a day staring at even bigger screens. You know, we barely exist from the neck down. And, and so the, in, the invitation and possibility of embodied cognition is just to say that, hey, um, you know, we, we kind of make a riff on uh, that old George Clinton, you know, Parliament Funkadelic. He used to say, free your mind and your ass will follow. Right. <laughs> but the other the opposite is true. It's like free your ass, you know, move our bodies and our minds follow. Mm. And I'm sure, you know, you, you are a super embodied dude. And, you know, you were also just mentioning experiencing with micro and macro dosing on, on psilocybin, you know. I would have you ever found yourself um, experiencing that compound in your system and then inspired to move. Right. Do you ever kind of, yeah, stretch, climb, run, you know, do those kind of things. And do you get more information out of that experience than if you were just sitting still? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, so the takeaway here is that not only should we not freeze our face because that's going to affect the rest of our bodies and our ability to be able to do everything from produce hormones to interact with, with other people in more dynamic ways. But we can also take that in the opposite direction. We can, we can either use these, these compounds or these technology tools, or even just like, you know, going snowboarding or skiing or doing some of the things that Steven and I talked about when I had him on the, on the podcast about achieving a state of flow to actually cause our biology to change. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And, and, and it's more fun. Interesting. Fundamentally. And we see we see animals doing this too. You guys go into the animal kingdom in the book, and uh, I thought this part of the book was was actually pretty fascinating. Animals, uh, not just humans, actually do take advantage, especially of some of these chemicals that we find in nature. Yeah. So uh, this is a really interesting line of research that kind of developed, sort of anecdotally, when people started to realize that holy crap, animals everywhere seem to have found ways to alter their consciousness. And, you know, this could be elephants drinking out of a fermented bog hole. This could be baboons who use iboga. It's an extremely powerful psychedelic jaguars on ayahuasca. Uh, goats gobble magic mushrooms. Birds will chew marijuana seeds. Uh, National Geographic cap captured some footage a couple years ago of dolphins getting high on pufferfish toxin, which induces a trance state in dolphins. And it's everywhere in, in, in nature. And, and so UCLA psychopharmacologist Ronald Siegel started really taking a look at it. And he has actually uh, come to the conclusion that the urge to alter our consciousness, um, the urge to get out of kind of our normal waking state, um, is a fundamental evolutionary driver. He calls it the fourth urge. So it's as powerful as the urge towards sex or shelter or substance. And, um, you know, the next question is, of course, why is this going on? And earlier you talked about lateral thinking, thinking outside the box. Mm. So what we have discovered is yeah. in evolution, right, every organism from, you know, humans to mammals to birds, we get stuck in a rut. We can't see new solutions to our problems. But by altering our consciousness, right, what is happening is we're increasing the brain's information processing capacity. We are increasing pattern recognition. So the linking of closely related ideas, lateral thinking, the linking together of disparate ideas, it's getting us out of ruts. It's helping us innovate new solutions. And it's so fundamental, this urge to alter our consciousness, that it's actually a biological driver. It's found everywhere in nature. And you see it, I mean, look at little kids. The, I mean, one of the greatest expressions of this is little kids spinning in circles, hyperventilating, rolling down hills, doing everything mm -hmm. they can to alter their consciousness. So it's, it's built in. We see it very, very early on in development, and we see it everywhere in nature because it's such a boost yeah. of creative problem solving. 
that's interesting that you talk about like rolling around and, and breathing and hyperventilating and things like that. Like one of the one of the highest states I've ever been in was completely drug free and was basically a holotropic breath class. You know, ninety minutes of breathing with a whole bunch of other people in the room also breathing. And there was choreographed music and an instructor kind of walking us through all these breathing patterns. And I had a complete uh, out of body experience while doing that. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it's crazy. You, you can even breathe yourself into, into these type of states. And actually, one thing I wanted to ask you, it's kind of related to that, is when you have a whole bunch of people in the same room doing these type of things together, is there is there something that happens like in terms of like heart rates or brain waves or the electrical signals from other people that somehow magnifies the effect? Yeah. You know, like, because I, I think about these things like Burning Man or, or raves or you know like my experience there in in a small room of a whole bunch of people doing holotropic breath work. Like, have they researched whether or not things are going on as far yes. as like the interaction between humans? All yeah, the absolutely. Together? And and you know uh, again Mo- Molly Crockett, who's just kind of she's a contemporary who's kind of pushing this as far as anybody. You know, sh- uh, collective behavioral synchrony is the kind of fancy term. Group flow would be another placeholder for it. And between, um, and there's also been some work at Isade Business School in Barcelona, which was kind of, you know, top ranked business school in the world by the Wall Street Journal a couple of years in a row. Um, and those guys did a, a micro study, which was just a room full of business school students hooked up to biometrics. And what they found was that the strongest leaders weren't the ones who talked the most or sort of verbalized the right ideas. They were the ones who could regulate their own nervous systems and in turn could then regulate those around them. So what you have is is leadership, emergent leadership can be defined, at least within this experiment, as the people who sort of function like the biggest pendulum, the biggest pendulum that all the other pendulums, all the other clocks, right, then attune to. And so the ability for whether it's a DJ up front or a dancer or just the kind of ripple effect of a crowd gathering around something can be very profound and, again, tends to tends to cue off the serotonin and oxytocin systems, as well as any mirror neuronal activity. So having additional music or rhythm or beats that are both shit, you know, basically tuning a bunch of people's neuroelectricity to similar brainwave states and music often can drop our brainwave states out of active beta into alpha and even theta. We're watching each other's movements. We're imitating or synchronizing, like doing the wave at a football um, game or anything like that. And then the shift in neurochemistry, all those things combined create what Victor Turner, the anthropologist at UMass Chicago called communitas. And so it's that shared syncing up and connecting with each other, almost like computers and serial that can give some of the most powerful experiences. I think people have reported as humans, you know, a bunch of us together all on the same wavelength. And I mean, Ben, you, you know, to drive Jamie's point home, in research, right, we, the research shows that flow, for example, is considered the most pleasurable experience on Earth. But re- uh, research that was done, at, I, think, I want to say Cal State Fullerton, found that the vast majority of people prefer group flow to flow. So, like, the best we get to feel on the planet may be this exact experience. Yeah. And what Jamie was just describing in terms of music, you have a whole term for this in the book called neuromusicology. I, and I love music. You know, I grew up playing violin and now I play guitar and ukulele. And, you know, you you go into research I wasn't really aware of in the book where they've actually tracked people's brainwave states in response to music. And also, I think you use the term uh neurochemicals, you know, uh, or, or stress hormones, you know, like, like norepinephrine and cortisol and what's actually happening in response to music. And it's fascinating. Like, like, uh, like what, what happens when tunes are playing in a house? Can you get into that? Like, like what happens and, and how they study, you know, with like, uh, like cameras and and everything, like what's happening when we play music in a house? Well, you just, just come off of what Jamie said and what you guys were talking about. So neuromusicology is literally the study of the impact of music on the brain. And what we what we lo- have learned is that when we listen to music, right, as Jamie alluded to, brain waves move from kind of the high beta of normal waking consciousness down into the meditative ranges of alpha and theta. Stress hormones like norepinephrine and cortisol drop. And social bonding reward chemicals like dopamine, endorphin, oxytocin, they all spike, right? So Apple and the speaker manufacturer, Sonos, decided to take a look at music's bonding power, its power to connect. And they rigged 30 homes with Sonos speakers and Apple watches and Nest cams and iBeacons. And they just recorded what happens 
when tunes were playing and when they weren't. And they discovered is that when tunes were playing, the distance between housemates decreased by 12%. Cooking, I think, increased by 33%. Laughing together by 15%. Inviting people over spiked at 85%. And you know, saying I love you 18% and having sex by 37%. So like the whole thing we've been saying, you know, right now about like the music shifting our consciousness and bringing people closer together, what they did is they measured it, put some numbers around. I would imagine that there's probably a little bit of a difference between like death metal and uh, I don't know, I suppose what we listen to at our house, like classical goes pop or top 40 mm-hmm. pop songs or well, is it as like the probably the lone death metal fan in this group I will <laughs> say it just depends on the group of people who are together i suppose Sometimes, so. you know you, you get you get a whole bunch of people banging their heads together it is a non-ordinary state and i mean and that was the great secret about you know thrash pits at punk shows right on the outside it looks violent and crazy and certainly there was some of that but on the inside, anybody who had that experience will tell you it's an experience of communitas, of love and caring for one another. Yes, it's very, very aggressive, but it was a it's a bonding experience. It's not, you know, violence that's pushing people apart. It's, it's, it's an expression of violence, a dance of violence, maybe that's bringing people together. So, you know, it depends to each his own on that one. We've talked a lot about psychedelics during this podcast and of course you can make a lot of mistakes you can do a lot of damage to yourself if you're not careful you can develop addictions i mean there there are obviously dark sides to psychedelics as well Uh, and also just you know engineering your brain in general you know even using like stimulation of of the motor cortex or you know say float tanks or, or things along those lines are there any rules that we can follow any kind of like best practices to ensure that we can tap into the type of ecstasy or or state of ecstasis or or flow that, that you describe in the book and still kind of be safe. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a a great and critical point, Ben. We actually devote the whole last chapter to exactly that Um, because, you know, you guys were just playing around with the idea of, you know, hey, you know, birds do it, bees do it, you know, this drive to get out of ourselves appears to be sort of prevalent throughout the animal kingdom. And if Michael Moss, the Pulitzer winning uh, New York Times writer, wrote a book called Salt, Sugar, Fat a few years ago, and he was basically saying, hey, those were flavors that were so rare through all of human history that now we have the Cheesecake Factory and chilies that are just bombing us with these things we don't know what to do with ourselves, right? And in fact, there was a there was even a secret meeting in Venice uh, in the 90s by all the big food and tobacco companies, and they were trying to find the bliss point. And the bliss point was the exact combination of salt, sugar, fat that would just prompt us to lose our minds. And it worked, right? So, you know, the, all those, 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 those industries have basically given us things that used to be so rare and scarce that our evolutionary biology just says, "Gut yourself stupid on them because, because you'll never see them, you know, you'll never see them again for months or years even. And the same thing has now happened with these techniques of ecstasy. So if it's a fourth evolutionary drive, right, as Ron Siegel at UCLA suggests, Mm. um, and now we have pretty much unlimited access to what used to be once in a lifetime, (laughs) once in a blue moon experiences, we have to be super careful that we don't end up ecstatically obese the same way we are uh, dietarily. Mm. And so, uh, you know, one of the simplest ways to do it is what we would call sort of hedonic calendaring, which is how do you pace and how do you sequence your experience of these states and and not just gut yourself stupid on them and end up in addictions and delusions and and various other ways to kind of overcook. So the simplest way to think about it is if you kind of divide it into things you could do every day, basically foundational practices that are good for you and within reason you can't really do too much of, and that would be the yoga, the stretching, the flossing your teeth, you know, those kinds of things, foundational good things. And then once a week, almost what, you know, you, you were referring to uh, spiritual faith, you know, Sabbaths are an easy placeholder in Judeo Christian culture. But the one day a week where I am going to kind of create a bit of a, a micro blips feels better, some, something that I check into that's a non-ordinary state. Once a month, a deeper dive. Once a quarter, once a year, and the once a year could be a trip to Burning Man. Could be okay, a trip so to that, Peru. that would be like like an annual ayahuasca retreat or something like that. That'd be like once a year. You wouldn't want to have like a shaman come to your house every month and do ayahuasca, for example. 
Exactly. And then you exactly. know, it could it could be an ultra marathon. Right. It doesn't all have to be mm. you know, substance based. It could, it could be it could be a nine day Vipassana meditation retreat, but something that's big, intensive, requires prep, requires recovery. Right. It just might not be practical to do or might be such a discombobulating experience. You actually need, you know, months or even years of integration you know, afterwards. So that would be the idea is, is, you know, on a daily basis, the game is how many things that are good for me. Can I create rituals and habits around? So I do them and that builds my foundation. And then for the, the weekly through annuals, it's how can I put these things in, you know, frequent enough that they help me maintain momentum, but not so frequent, right, that they end up leaving me getting a little soft around the edges. And so we would then say the final bit of that would be include some period of forbearance. And you can tie it to, tradi- to traditional ones like Ramadan, Yom Kippur, Lent. Or you can make up your own, like New Year's or back to school, whatever works, and say, okay, for 30 days, I'm going to set aside all my pleasure-producing ecstatic techniques or technologies, including my morning bulletproof coffee and my, you know, four squares of dark chocolate, or, you know, set it all aside. Forbearance being like the opposite of hedonism. Exactly. And then you can say, because most people have this kind of guilt slash indulgence relationship to a lot of these things. They do them because they're drawn to them, back to that fourth evolutionary drive. Then they do too much of them. Then they feel really bad about it. Then they go cold turkey, and then they come back to it guiltily later because there's that fourth evolutionary drive thing. And so they just pinball back and forth between too much, too little. And so by hedonically calendaring it, you can say, hey, now if it's too much, like if in that month I really realized that I had an itch to scratch and I'm thinking about it a lot, you just move it to the right on your calendar. But you get to keep the practices and have them do the beneficial work without taking you off the rails. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Like I I, uh, I fast from Saturday night now until Sunday night. And the last few times that I've fasted, you know, it is kind of this this version of hedonic calendaring that you talk about where, you know, I typically end my fast with, uh, you know, the, these days uh, a, an, an edible and a nice ribeye steak at about the same time the edible kicks in so that I really enjoy the food. And, and it's fantastic, right? It's that perfect blend of a 24-hour fast and then some, some extreme hedonism. You know, I'll have a steak and then go out in the hot tub and sip a glass of red wine. So, yeah, I get what you're saying. You guys even have a whole, uh, you have a hedonic, what is it, a hedonic calendar in the book, a, fr- a free PDF that comes along with the book where you kind of help people sort their activities into this combination of, of hedonism and forbearance so that we don't kind of like overdo either. Well, the important, and the important thing to note is that one of the reasons that we, you really, it's not just scratching that evolutionary itch. It's important. What the research shows, and there's a lot of research that was done out of Harvard on adult development, is that, you know, stepping outside oneself periodically, getting this wider perspective actually helps you move up the adult development scale. And as we move up the adult development scale, right, you get what, what you gain is empathy and perspective. You get the ability to see things from multiple perspectives. And you can only get that by stepping outside of yourself periodically. But you basically, over time, as long as you're doing the homework, right? And Jamie talked about integration. You definitely have to integrate this stuff. So it's not he- hedonism. It's, you know, it, it's moving you forward. But what you see is that people move up the adult development scale. They, they gain these traits associated with wisdom, which have you know, all kinds of benefits, including like in my, the most fascinating research to me is stuff done by Bill Torbert at Boston College, who found that kind of the higher you move up the development scale, the farther ahead you move in business, right? The, the higher up managerial positions you end up, you know, occupying and the, kind of the bigger and better impact you have for your company. So kind of what the research shows is that consciousness goes right to the bottom line. It's so interesting. It, it, it's, I mean, we only really kind of scratch the surface of of how to actually kind of like like loop all this together and and wrap our heads around you know how there's this link between you know Burning Man and animals taking psychedelics and you know using things like you know our modern technological versions of the God Helmet that people can now practically purchase online and use. But uh, this this book. Uh, got me thinking and so I guess laterally thinking in so many different ways. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating. I really think it's a must read for anybody who wants to kind of like survive and thrive uh, in, in a world that is changing rapidly when it comes to the way that we're interacting with things like psychedelics 
and technology because this isn't just people who are rich and bored sitting around in the desert taking LSD. This is, you know, as the title of the book alludes to, the way that Silicon Valley and the Navy SEALs and Maverick scientists are revolutionizing the way that we live and the way that we work. And I think it's a pretty dang cool book. So um, if you're listening in right now, first of all, link to the book and everything that we talked about over in the show notes. You just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash stealing fire. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash stealing fire. And you can check out everything that we talked about and also all my previous uh, podcast episodes that I've done uh, with Steven. Um, and also, Steven, Jamie, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show sharing all this stuff and also writing a freaking fantastic book. Ben, thank you so much. But I, you know, I got to shout out back to you. Thank you for kind of everything you do. I think you're, you know, one of the smarter, brighter people working in the hacking fitness space. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, kind of an honor to get to interact. Thanks, man. For sure. Thanks. That'll be until I fry my brain with some messed up warped version of the God helmet got to be careful on reddit um don't i, I you know uh, this is a lot last thing i was uh i was doing a, i was presenting at summit in, in eden and tim barris was in the audience and we were talking you know I, I talked about some of this stuff and you know tim pointed out he said you know be really careful with kind of the nine volt battery diy reddit thread version of this you get it wrong you're going to make yourself really stupid for a little while right right you want to remember third grade math everybody i'm sure it's important at some point i don't know when but you might want to use that so um cool guys well thanks for coming on the show and again if you're listening in head over to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash stealing fire to access the show notes and until next time i'm ben greenfield along with stephen kotler and Jamie Wheel signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have a healthy week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 